All right, guys, we're back with uh, Chapter 9, which is Crime Scene Follow-Up and Investigations. We're going to try to do the entire chapter here in one voice recording, so probably around 40-ish minutes. Uh, we're going to start with Lesson 1, Evidence, Rules, and Concepts. A crime scene is the site or sites where a crime occurred, included in an area or areas that contain evidence from the crime committed. A crime scene can be a location, a person, a place, or an object associated with criminal behaviors. Before I get too much deeper into this, uh, make sure you guys are reading the chapter. I am only going over things that I thought were important and that I highlighted. So uh, everything else obviously is up for grabs. The Florida Evidence Code found in Chapter 90 of the Florida Statutes provides the basic concepts and rules of evidence that may be used in a criminal or civil proceeding. Evidence is anything that tends to prove or disprove the existence of a fact. Evidence is information that is allowed in court, while proof is the effect produced by that information. So evidence is information, while proof is the effect produced by that information. Uh, evidence has three basic functions when offered in court. To prove or disprove a crime, to support or undermine other evidence, or to help undermine an appropriate sentence. Direct evidence proves a fact without an inference or presumption, and which, if true in itself, conclusively establishes that fact. For example... Direct evidence that someone was speeding would be the admission by the driver that they were speeding, speed measurement device results, and testimony from eyewitnesses who saw the driver speeding. Indirect or circumstantial evidence requires an inference or presumption to establish a fact. An example of indirect or circumstantial evidence is eyewitness testimony that the defendant entered the victim's home around the time of the scene. It requires the judge or jury to infer from the evidence that the defendant committed the crime. Contrary to the speeches given by criminal defense lawyers on television, the basis for most criminal cases is primarily indirect or circumstantial evidence. So that could be a test question. Just remember, most criminal cases, you have indirect or circumstantial evidence. You don't really have much direct evidence. So then we're going to move on to the different types of evidence here. We're going to start with testimonial evidence it is a witness statement that tends to prove or disprove facts about the case. Testimonial evidence is generally less reliable than physical evidence, uh, probably because it's coming from a third party. Physical or real evidence refers to actual objects offered to prove or disprove facts about a case. Examples include items such as trace evidence, biological and touch DNA evidence, impression evidence, firearms evidence, electronic, chemical or toxicological evidence, and question documents evidence. Physical evidence can either be fruits of a crime, instrumentalities of a crime, or contraband. The definition of fruits of a crime are the objects obtained by the defendant because of committing the crime. An example is money stolen by a bank robber. Documentary evidence is anything written or printed that is offered to prove or disprove facts pertaining to the case. It includes bank records, medical records, or a certified copy of a driving history. Then we're going to move on to admissibility of evidence. This refers to the legal requirements you must meet before a jury can see or hear about the evidence. The admissibility of evidence also depends upon three factors here. The officer must obtain the evidence legally and preserve it properly. The evidence must be relevant to the case. The evidence cannot be unfairly prejudicial, confusing, or based on hearsay. Then the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine holds that the court may exclude evidence from trial if the officer obtained it illegally. Uh, for example, an illegal interrogation leads to the discovery of a murder weapon. Uh, the good faith exception doctrine holds that if you execute a search warrant that you believe to be valid and a court later determines the warrant has a legal error, the court may still admit any seized evidence. <clears throat> then we're going to move on to lesson two, secure and protect the crime scene. Your first priority is to secure, protect, and preserve the crime scene to avoid containing any evidence. The second priority must be to search for, identify, document, collect, and maintain the physical evidence. So first priority, secure, protect, preserve. Second priority is to search, identify, document, collect, and maintain the evidence. Then we're going to move on to securing a crime scene. Before conducting your investigation, make sure the crime scene occurred within your jurisdiction, obviously. Uh, crime scene perimeter should be larger rather than smaller. It is easier to reduce the size of the perimeter than to enlarge it. I can see that as a test question as well. Larger and then go smaller with time. You have the authority to arrest any person who, after receiving a warning, crosses an area marked by a crime scene tape. So you can warn people and then arrest them no problem with a crime scene tape. A uh, person occupying private property has an expectation of privacy that no one can violate without a search warrant or a valid exception to the warrant requirement. An officer has permission to enter private property based on exigent circumstances to conduct a sweep for potential suspects, 
to provide first aid, or if there is any indication that evidence will be lost, destroyed, or removed prior to obtaining a search warrant for consent to search. The crime scene log is a document that details the name, rank, and agency of each person entering or leaving the scene, the date and time of the person's entry and exit, and the reason the person was at the scene. <clears throat> officers not assigned to the crime scene do not have access just because they're law enforcement officers. I can see that being a trick question as well. Um, if they're not assigned to the scene, they're not allowed to walk in just because they have a badge. Then we'll move on to lesson three, manage victims, witnesses, and suspects, uh, identifying people on the scene. A person can belong to more than one um, of these categories in regards to complaints, victims, witnesses, and suspects. Just keep that in mind. Um, they could fit multiple roles at once. Uh, then we move on to separate and involve people. Multiple witnesses who have experienced the same event never recall the same details. So multiple witnesses, they never recall the same exact details. Um, make sure, obviously, to keep them separate and they don't overhear each other talking. Then we move to lesson four, document the crime scene. Photographing the crime scene. Photographing the scene is the first event that should take place when documenting the crime scene. So the question on the test says, when you're documenting a crime scene, what is the first thing you do? That would be to photograph the scene, uh, which is the first event that takes place. Uh, then we'll move on to crime scene photography moves from general to specific, which means you take overall, mid-range, and then close-up photographs. So start big and then go small. Uh, make sure to look at all photographs after taking the pictures to make sure that they are in focus. Standard camera flashes will project only 9 to 12 feet. Keep that in memory. When it comes to flashes, 9 to 12 feet uh, is the furthest they'll go. Photographic framing is composing the photograph so that it depicts what you are trying to document. For example, in overall or mid-range photography, overlap the photos to show the relationship of items in the crime scene. You can use a flashlight for enhanced lighting. Use oblique lighting, better known as side lighting, when phot photographing shoe or tire impressions or tool marks. So when they say, hey, when you're trying to get a good view of tire impressions, shoe mark, latent prints, what type of lighting are you going to use? It's going to be oblique lighting, which is also known as side lighting. Examples of perishable evidence can include blood, footprints, tire impressions, trace evidence, such as hair or fibers. Um, transitory evidence is evidence that can blow or wash away. Fragile evidence can include a bullet hole in glass held in place by a thin window tint. And based on the circumstances at the scene, you need to photograph these types of evidence first. So anything that's fragile, transitory, or perishable by any means, make sure to photograph and document that first. When photographing specific items such as blood drops, weapons, or tire marks, place a scale or identifier in the photograph with the evidence to establish the original positions and draw attention to relevant objects or, or evidence. So when they say you're taking a picture of a blood drop, shell casings, weapons, what do you place in the photograph um, in order to you know, figure out the position and the size? It would be a scale or identifier. Other examples of scales or identifiers are Miranda cards, dollar bills, or coins. So maybe if they say, hey, what can you use as an identifier if you don't have a scale on you? Uh, dollar bill and Miranda cards, coins, uh, some of the examples given in the book. In regards to photographing people, a suspect does not have the right to refuse photographing injuries, such as scratches from the victim or blood evidence. So remember, when it comes to a suspect, they cannot refuse. You are allowed to take whatever pictures you want. When it comes to a victim, they can refuse any time. You must ask for consent. Uh, it may be wise to have a witness present when photographing these types of injuries um, in, in reference to uh, genital organs or anything that's a little suspicious. Make sure to have a witness present. When you're sketching the crime scene, if you're going to sketch the crime scene, do this after photography, um, photographing the scene and before you begin any detailed work. Uh, I doubt we're going to be doing any sketches, but make sure to do this after uh, photographing, but before you start actually working on the evidence. Before you begin to photograph or sketch a crime scene of a person, write the following information on a piece of paper or whiteboard and take a photograph. That would be a case number, the location, date and time, and officer's name. You'll include that in the photograph. Uh, the the photographs that you take. Then we're going to move on to lesson five, evidence handling procedures. Uh, in regards to searching for evidence, the type of crime committed determines the type of evidence to search for at a scene. For example, at a burglary scene, search for evidence of illegal entry, such as pry marks on a door frame or broken windows. Then we're going to move on to types of searches. The first one being the grid. Just remember with the grid, this one will often be used indoors. Uh, and this is a variation of the strip line search pattern. Searchers overlap a series of lanes in a cross pattern, making the search more methodical and thorough. 
So basically, it's kind of like the strip line where you're going up and back, up and back, up and back, except when you get to the end, you go up and back the other way. So just think of it as overly dramatic, too much searching, and you're going to do something like that indoors because you can, you have a box. So you can go up and down, up and down, up and down, and then back and around, right? So then we're going to move on to spiral, which is usually used outdoors by one person. Uh, the searcher begins at a center point and walks in an increasingly larger circles to the outermost boundary of the search area. I'm not going to go too much into this one. This is simple. You just start in the middle and you, you squirm your way around. Uh, and the name obviously spiral speaks for itself. So then we're going to move to the strip line. This is usually used outdoors by several people. Divide the search area into lanes. Have one or more people search each lane by moving in both directions, examining all areas. So you're just going up and down the lanes, right? Or you're walking in a line and moving forward. Next, we move on to our last type of search, which is zone and quadrant. This is used for vehicle searches, both indoors and outdoors or large area. Divide the area into four different sections and search each area using one of the patterns above. So this is good for vehicle because you'll search in quadrants where you have the driver's side, then you have the passenger side, then you have the rear passenger, rear driver. Uh, that'll be for zone quadrant. So when they ask, hey, what, how do you search a vehicle? Obviously, the only one that really makes sense here would be the zone and quadrant because you're moving in sections. Um, so let's see if we can recap here real quick. So the ones we use outdoors are strip and line and spiral. And then the one we use indoors is grid. And then the ones for vehicle is zone or quadrant. But zone and quadrant, it says you can use for indoors and outdoors or large or small area. So that one's kind of everything, but I'm assuming if they do ask that on the test, it'll be specific to vehicles. Next here, we move to types of physical evidence. We have this graph here. I'm just going to briefly go through them, uh, knock them out real quick. So trace evidence. That are the things left behind. So hair, fibers, clothing, uh, paint chips, transfer evidence, glass, wood, soil, dirt, things that you bring in, you leave behind. Then you have biological evidence. That's anything from your body, blood, semen, saliva, bones, teeth, body tissues, hair, touch DNA. Then you have impression evidence, uh, things you leave behind by pushing in of some sort. So you have fingerprints, tire marks, shoe marks, footprints, bite marks, tool marks. Then you have firearm evidence, so anything related to guns, which is weapons, projectiles, gunshot residue, cartridge casings, tool marks, database information. Then you have electronic evidence, such as cell phones, thumb drives, laptops, notebooks, tablets, computers, smart homes, security devices, external hard drives, digital cameras, CDs, DVDs, VHSs, answering machine, digital recording devices. So if you quickly look over these electronic ones, they're all electronic devices. Um, so keep that in mind. It's not things that you use electronically, and it's it's like the actual device itself. Then you have uh, chemistry or toxico toxicological evidence, which is blood, alcohol levels, drugs, and poisons. So that's the only thing under the chemistry one is just blood, alcohol levels, drug levels, and poisons in your body. Then you have a uh, questioned documents evidence. So that's anything that's like, I know the teacher said paper and things that are like physically written, but that's not what they got here. They have photocopies, photographs cameras, phone bills, credit cards, wire transfers, bank statements. None of that is really written. So I'm just assuming, just think of paper and a document and I'm assuming that would fall under question document evidence. Uh, then we're gonna move on to the triangle of evidence. So the triangle of evidence consists of the crime being in the middle and you're trying to connect the suspect to the location to the victim. So you should create a triangle of evidence that connects both the suspect and the victim to the scene, just as I said before. Uh, do note that PPE will protect the evidence from contamination and you from exposure to dangerous substances. Change gloves between collecting each piece of evidence and needing DNA analysis. So make sure every single thing that you're, you're getting tested for DNA, you change your gloves every single time. That way you're not cross-contaminating. Uh, cross so wet evidence, such as items soaked with body fluids or living plant material, must be air-dried, packaged in a breathe breathable container, such as a paper bag or both. Place each piece of evidence collected for DNA analysis in its own separate container. Then we're going to move here to trace evidence. Trace evidence is small quantities of material transferred from a victim or a suspect to each other or to a crime scene. Microanalysis is the process of analyzing trace evidence with a microscope to determine a possible source of origin. So remember, microanalysis goes with trace evidence because it's, think of like small things left behind, right? Um, holding a flashlight to create side light and using a magnifying glass may help you spot fiber evidence. So I guess a question could come around and say, you're trying to spot fiber evidence on wherever a couch, 
what are some options to discover that, right? So it's holding a flashlight, you're creating oblique side light lighting and a magnifying glass. Then we're gonna move on to biological evidence. Uh, make sure to consider all objects at a crime scene as possible sources of DNA because they could touch anything, do anything. The most common biological specimens include blood, seminal fluid, or saliva. So again, the most common biological specimens include blood, seminal fluid, or saliva. Blood type and DNA identification are also possible with a blood sample. So if they ask if you have a blood sample, what are the possible results from that? It's getting someone's blood type and their DNA identification. Uh, do note that a medical examiner or a trained forensic specialist should see the bones at the site as discovered. So if they ask about coming across the scene of bones, make sure you don't move anything and you're contacting the medical examiner as soon as possible and they need to see the bones, how they were placed in the dirt, etc. Uh, then we're going to move on to impression evidence. Never try to fit a suspect's tool into a mark. Do not attempt to reconstruct the items or process fingerprints from the pieces before submitting them. So we're talking about um, a pry bar and a door, right? You don't, like like the teacher said, you don't go and put the pry bar up to the spot in the door because you might mess something up. So just keep it there, document it, photograph it, etc. cetera. Uh, teeth can provide dental evidence in the form of bite mark impressions that can lead to the identity of the suspect. Photograph bite marks as soon as possible with a scale or identifier. Now we're going to move on to fingerprints. Uh, we're going to go through pa uh, patent prints, plastic prints, and latent prints. So patent prints, which form from the friction ridges or corrugated lines on fingers. A plastic print is a molded or embedded fingerprint that you can easily see created by touching an impressionable surface such as fresh paint, wax, bar of soap, or mud. Um, latent prints are among the most valuable and common types of physical evidence at a crime scene. Latent prints result from body residues left behind when the friction ridges of the hands or feet make contact with the surface. So the easiest way to memorize these, I would say of these three, the easiest one to memorize is plastic print. It's plastic, so just think of you're pushing your hand into something, whether it's hot plastic, wax, fresh paint. Um, that's just simply an impression service. Uh, think about pressing into putty, right? Then patent prints, remember those are visible. That's what you can see. The way I memorize that is when you have a patent on a product, you put a big stamp on that product saying, hey, this is patent pending or this has patent approved. You can see that, right, on a product. So patent prints are visible. You can see them because they're in blood, right? Then um, you move to latent prints. Those are the prints left behind. Like right now, I'm pushing my finger on the page. Uh, you might have some sweat or oils on your skin. You push it down. I don't see that. But if I, you know, use oblique lighting or something else, you'll be able to see that fingerprint there. So latent prints are invisible, patent prints are visible, and plastic print is just something into an impressionable service here. Uh, do note that latent prints are among the most valuable and common types of physical evidence at a crime scene. So if the question comes up, says you're at a crime scene, what would be the most common type of evidence that you might discover? That would be uh, invisible latent prints. Um, let's see here. Before moving the item and to prevent destruction of a latent print, photograph the print with a scale or identifier in a RAW plus JPEG setting on a point-and-shoot camera. This setting allows the RAW image to remain unaltered. Uh, so again, if they ask what's the best setting for taking a photography uh, photograph, it's RAW plus JPEG setting. Uh, it's kind of cut and dry there. In regards to using uh, dust for, for getting latent prints, it is better to use too little than too much because it gets everywhere. Then we're going to move on to elimination prints. These allow fingerprint anal uh, analysts to distinguish between prints belonging to either the victims and the witnesses or the possible suspects. So, for example, if there's a murder in my house, they're going to get my prints, my siblings' prints, my parents' prints, um, because those are obviously going to be there. And they need to eliminate those from the scene to see if they can find anything else that doesn't belong. So that's an elimination print. Uh, place the weapon well, we're moving on to firearms evidence here. Uh, place the weapon in a firearm or evidence box. Put the magazine and the ammunition in a separate container. So make sure you keep the magazine and ammunition separate from the gun. Next, we're going to move on to electronic evidence. Do not manipulate or attempt to operate any part of the equipment to avoid possible damage to it. However, you may consider placing a handheld device in an airplane mode to keep the owner from accessing it remotely. Uh, the other option is consider placing the mobile electronic device in an anti-static Faraday bag that will prevent any communication with the seized device. So the two modes for kind of keeping a device secure and inaccessible would be airplane mode or Faraday bag. Uh, do note this U.S. Supreme Court 
in Riley v. California, in the case with Riley v. California, ruled that it is unconstitutional to search a cell phone without a search warrant unless there are officer safety concerns or exigent circumstances. So if they ask for the case that has to do with searching a cell phone, you need a warrant based on Riley v. California. Now we're going to move on to chemical or toxicology evidence. In certain criminal investigations where you believe the suspect or victim is using drugs or alcohol, you may submit an FDLE laboratory letter and obtain analysis from the toxicology section of a crime laboratory. These cases usually result from investigations of DUI, sexual assault, and death. Um, whenever you place, keep in mind that whenever you place something that has uh, needles, pins, syringes, or sharp objects in a bag, that you put some sort of label or sticker on there that says warning sharps. Uh, then we're going to move on to questioned document evidence. A document is anything containing a mark to convey a message. That's all really I got there because when it comes to questioned document evidence, that's just that's just paper stuff. You're obviously going to handle all documents um, carefully and preserve them. Then we're going to move on to chain of custody. When you recover evidence of any kind, begin a chain of custody to document everyone who handled the evidence as well as when, why, and what changes, if any, were made to it. A chain of custody documentation proves that the evidence submitted in court is the same evidence collected at the crime scene. Next, we're moving on to Unit 2, Lesson 1, Initiative Follow-Up Investigation. Agency policies and procedures determine to what extent you will pursue a follow-up investigation. The prosecutor, also known as the state attorney, may need more information to make a filing decision and may request a follow-up investigation. Uh, next, Analyze Incident Reports. To begin a follow-up investigation, locate and review the records of the initial or preliminary investigation and establish a case file as required by your agency. Now we're moving to following leads. A lead provides more information on a case that requires further investigation. Leads create avenues for follow-up and can come from many sources, such as anonymous tips, confidential sources, social media, forensic analysis, surveillance footage, and victim and witness statements. We're going to move to uh, field contacts and confidential sources of information. A field contact is any person you have contact with while on patrol, such as a concerned resident or an anonymous complainant who does not necessarily generate an incident report. Field contacts are often key to solving a case. Then we're going to move on to confidential sources, which are people who furnish police with information about crimes, primarily for personal benefit or advantage and rarely out of a sense of civil, uh, of civil duty. So just remember the difference between a field contact and a confidential source. Field contact is just anybody, random people, whatever that you meet on the road and you come in contact with. Where a confidential source, they're generally coming to you because it benefits them or maybe they're getting um, some sort of advantage out of it. So a good situation might be I'm a drug dealer but I want to work with you in order to get a different, uh, you know, different drug dealer off the road to maybe help my business, right? That could potentially be a confidential source, and that benefits me and obviously you as the cop, right? So then we're going to move on to a documented confidential informant. A documented confidential informant is a type of confidential source who an officer recruits and manages based on their agency guidelines. Um, so the difference between a confidential source and a documented confidential informant is – a confidential informant is a type of confidential source, but you would actually recruit them and manage them based on agency guidelines, right? Um, I think one of these actually get paid. Let's see, to do which one here gets paid. Both provide information. I don't see it here, but I know confidential sources can get paid to an extent. Uh, then we're going to move on to gathering information on an unknown suspect, which is modus operandi. Uh, meaning mode of operating or MO refers to how someone does something usually repetitive in nature. So if you watched uh, the behavioral analysis unit, um, criminal minds or whatever, if I stab somebody in the head twice and that's how I commit my crime every single time, I stab them twice in the head for whatever reason, that would be my MO. Um, maybe I leave, maybe I take, I don't know, a lock of hair from each person I kill or I always enter from a bathroom window. Those are types of MO. Uh, which is modus operandi. Then we move on to crime patterns. Develop potential suspects by loco locating reports of crimes similar to the crime you're investigating. Review reports for similarities. So this kind of goes with the MO. You read a report and you say, hey, you broke into the bathroom window here and use a crowbar. Then you go to the next report and it says, hey, he broke into the bathroom window and use a crowbar. That's kind of these patterns that you're going to see using the modus operandi MO. Um, 
when you're having a lot of crime in an area, consider searching the Department of Corrections list of released inmates or the supervision status of former inmates. It may provide web-based information on all incarcerated and supervised offenders, use this database to compare release dates of certain types of offenders with currently developing crime trends. So for example, if you're getting a whole bunch of burglary for some reason out of nowhere, you might go on to the Department of Corrections list of released inmates and see, hey, this guy who's a repeated offender for burglary just got out two days before these burglaries started, and that could be a great place to uh, start with an unknown suspect. Then we're going to move on to Unit 2, Lesson 3, which is gathering information on a known suspect. So you're going to start with gathering information. Having a known suspect is just the beginning of the follow-up investigation. A check for public records, criminal history, law enforcement reports, interview reports, driving records, and traffic citations can provide valuable information about your suspect. There are two main types of records, both private and public. Private records of privately owned businesses or organizations, including privately owned utilities, are not open to the public, including law enforcement, and require court orders to access them. Public records, on the other hand, of government entities and publicly owned utilities are records that, with few exceptions, you may access on demand. Social media can provide considerable information regarding the suspect. Records pertaining to juvenile arrests and incidents with law enforcement are restricted from the public by Florida law. School resource officers are a good source of information regarding juvenile offenders. So the question says you have a juvenile offender and you maybe don't have information or you do have information on them, but you need more, contact the school resource officer as they're pretty close with them. Then uh, moving on to search for a known suspect or wanted person, after obtaining the suspect's full name, race, gender, and date of birth, conduct criminal justice database searches on David and FCIC and CIC to compile an accurate physical description of the suspect, address, or vehicle. This combined information can provide a likely location of the wanted person, including their residence, place of employment, or public or private locations they regularly visit. Remember that you may need a warrant. Agency resources that can assist in searching for a wanted person can include canine, air support, SWAT, or fugitive task force. Unit 2, Lesson 4, Show Up, Photographic Array, and Photo Lineup. A show up is the presentation of a possible suspect to a witness for identification and occurs during the same time or soon after the incident occurred and near the incident or crime scene. Use a show up in an immediate situation such as battery or robbery by sudden snatching as these can follow with immediate arrest. So if you have burglary or robbery by sudden snatching, you immediately want to do a follow up, a show up, right? Uh, let's see. Do not move the potential suspect to bring them to the victim or witness. So remember, you cannot move a potential suspect. If you do, then that would be arrest and potentially be false arrest if you have the wrong guy, right? So make sure you always bring the victim or witness to the person, never the bad guy to the victim. Before conducting a show up, uh, we have a couple things here. You want to interview all victims or witnesses separately to obtain a description of the suspect. Determine if the victim or witnesses has personal knowledge of the crime. Uh, determine if the victim or witnesses demonstrates competence, attentiveness, a sound state of mind, a lack of prejudice. Uh, determine if a suspect matching the victim's or witness description has been located near the incident. Uh, then you're go how and then you're gonna we're gonna move on to how to conduct a show up. Um, I'm not gonna list all of them here, but I'll list two that seem the most important. Make sure to take the victim or witness to the location of the suspect, not the suspect to the victim or witness. Like I said, like I said before, always bring the victim and witness to the suspect. Make sure to visually conceal the victim or witness from the suspect. So tinted windows, um, something along those lines. Just make sure they cannot see each other. Now we're going to move to lineups. A lineup should become a part of your follow-up investigation. Not too much going on here. Kind of the same thing. Uh, a live lineup. A live lineup is a procedure that displays a group of people to a victim or eyewitness so that they can identify the perpetrator of the crime and eliminate any suspects. So just remember, a live lineup is obviously you have seven people lined up actually there and you have to sit there and pick them out so that's a live lineup um, an eyewitness is a person who can identify another person by sight as someone involved in a criminal proceeding i'm gonna go real, real quick back to show up and line up so just the difference between those two a show up is you got somebody in custody right you got them detained and you have the victim come and verify that's the person where a lineup is you have a bunch of individuals in person and you're trying to make the victim or witness choose out of multiple people who's the correct one then we move to a photo lineup. A photo lineup is a procedure that displays a photo array to a victim or eyewitnesses so they can identify the perpetrator of a crime and eliminate any suspects. So uh, again, a photo lineup is a procedure that displays a photo array, right? So now we're gonna move to a photo array. A photo array is a selection of photographs compiled to show to a victim or eyewitness in a non-suggestive manner for identifying a suspect. 
So if they add, if there's a difference between the photo lineup and the photo array, just remember the photo lineup is the procedure that displays the photo array, where the photo array is just the selection of paragraphs compiled to show the person. Um, and with a photo array, you have to have a minimum of six photographs at least, where five being filler photographs of fake people, well, real people that are not the suspect but look like the suspect, and then only one photograph of the suspect. So remember, you have to have a minimum of six. You can have more than six, but minimum of six and a minimum of five filler, and you can only have one photograph of the actual suspect. Can't have two, you can only have one. Uh, then we're gonna move on to administrators for um, lineups. A lineup administrator is the person who conducts the lineup. Ideally, the lineup administrator should be independent of the investigation. An independent administrator, which is also a, would be the lineup administrator, is a person who is not participating in the investigation of the criminal offense and is unaware of which person in the lineup is a suspect. So just remember, with an independent administrator, they have no idea about the offense. They have no idea about the crime. They have no idea who the suspect is. They would just be handing the photo array and being like, hey, pick one, right? Um, then we're going to move on to when an independent administrator is not available, you must use one of these accepted procedures for conducting a photo lineup. So generally, you want to have an independent administrator because they're not involved or not biased. But if you don't, you have to do one of these two options. One is an automated computer program would automatically administer the photo lineup directly and prevents the lineup administrator from seeing the lineup until after the procedure is complete. So one is you're doing a computer, pro computer program. And then two is you randomly number and you shuffle folders containing photographs that are presented to the eyewitness in such a way that the lineup administrator cannot see which photos correspond to the specific folders until after the procedure is complete. So I actually had this done one time where they did a photo array, but they put them in a bunch of closed folders and they numbered them and they mixed them and they were like, all right, go ahead and start opening them and pick out um, the one that you think is a suspect, right? So I got like four deep in, I was like, that's the guy. So um, just uh, those are the two options if you don't have it independent, it is a computerized program or shuffling random folders. We're going to move on to photo array presentations. Simultaneous presentations occur when the independent administrator presents a group of photographs to the victim or eyewitnesses all at once at the same time. So that mine was a simultaneous presentation where they gave you six folders in one pile and said, hey, go through these until you see the one, right? Then you have a, sus a sequential presentation occurs when an independent administrator presents individual photographs to the victim or eyewitnesses one at a time. So, that, so remember, the difference between simultaneous... Well, the word simultaneous, right, means all at once. So you're handing them all at once, where sequential, it's in a sequence, right? So I'm going to hand you the first one, you're going to say yes or no. I'm going to hand you the second one, you're going to say yes or no, and we're going to keep moving on that way. All right, almost done here. We're uh, unit three, lesson one. This is the last lesson of the chapter, So, which is testimony. Prepare for a pretrial meeting. Remain truthful, honest, and accurate when discussing the case with the prosecutor. Uh, preparing for testimony. Assume that the defense attorney knows everything you know. Uh, rule of sequestration. Sometimes a judge invokes the rule of sequestration, which forbids anyone who will testify from discussing any aspect of a case with anyone but the involved attorneys. Florida law states that you must follow the judge's orders completely when they invoke or impose this rule. Violating this rule will mean the judge will penalize or punish the witness. You must never communicate with a juror or known potential juror except as directed by the court. Uh, moving on to answering questions. It is acceptable to say, I don't know when necessary. So if there's a question in the, in the exam that says, if you don't know the answer to the question, do you say yes? Do you say no? Do you go along with it? Or do you just straight up say, I don't know? The answer is just straight up say, I don't know. Um, then moving on to, 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 to the judge may permit you to explain why you do not know uh make sure to resist the urge to fill silence with extra testimony so if there's silence stay silent then we're gonna move on to objectionable questions if you hear an objection stop speaking until the judge rules if the judge sustains the objection you should not answer the question if the judge overrules the objection you must answer the question so if i'm speaking and you hear an objection make sure to stop talking if the judge sustains it then don't say nothing. If the judge overrules it, then you must answer the question. And then that completes chapter nine.